Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 150, I chat with Chris Vernon, CEO of Santia, about his stable phase technology, which promises to improve the sound of audio systems. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded March 4th, 2013, episode 150 Improving Audio One Speaker at a Time. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek. This week, my guest geek is Chris Vernon, who is the founder of Santia Limited, and the inventor of a new audio enhancement technology, which we're going to learn all about today. Hey, Chris, welcome to the show. Hi, Scott. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you for staying up so late. You're calling us all the way from beautiful England, and uh, it's quite beautiful. a bit later there than it is here, but uh, <laughs> we sure appreciate your, uh, your night owl nature, at least for today. No problem. Somewhere in the world it's morning. That's, uh, that's my force. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Hey, those who are tuned in to the live stream at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Chris, and I will pass along as many as I can. So, Chris, before we start talking about this new technology that you've developed, uh, I do want to point out a little bit of your history. You are, in fact, mm -hmm. a professional musician, a guitarist, mm -hmm. I believe. That's right, yeah. In another uh, and life. Yep, and you've, in fact, uh, done session work since you were 14 years old. That's right, yeah. I got started early as a... I was a, a classical guitarist um, and electric guitarist, uh, which gave me a bit of work because, you know, being able to read music, that kind of uh, that puts you in, in a different place as, as a guitarist, most, uh, most don't. <laughs> um, so, but, yeah, I started uh, hanging around studios, early a young age i guess and so that gave me you know two passions which were audio technology and coffee <laughs> yeah i guess coffee is very common amongst studios well speaking that of reading music yeah. you have heard the the old joke about how do you get the guitar get electric guitar player to turn down go on you, you put a piece of sheet music in front of him <laughs> <laughs> uh, musicians right. jokes <clears throat> anyway uh, then at age 19, you actually worked with Sir George Martin of Beatles fame. Sir George, yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I came on, George was a patron of a, a National Music Academy in the UK, and I came on to write some of the technology syllabus, uh, some of the, the course there. I taught and moderated there um, for a bit. Did that for about three years uh, I guess, and uh, yeah, it was a, a fantastic experience. So it spun out, started off in in various studios, and uh, then we we built studios, recording studios, um, in in a, a few colleges across the country, and rolled the course out there. And uh, yeah, it was that was a really great experience. I love that that you worked on an educational project to to teach mm. people, you know, how to how to record music and I'm sure mix and master and do all that stuff yeah, uh, yeah. for the next generation. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And then not only that, not only were you involved in music and music education and recording technology education, but uh, you also did some technical work on the uh, PS3 and PSP um, game consoles for Sony. We, yeah, we actually, what, what we were doing at the, at the colleges and universities at the time you know, game audio was a was a big thing, and so I was uh, doing a, a course module on game audio, and we we worked uh, quite closely with the games industry uh, to find out how we can you know train 
today's musicians and, and audio engineers to uh, to have the appropriate skill sets. And looking at the the games industry, you know, I saw some very capable hardware and some incredibly talented uh, programmers. Um, on the other hand, you had you know really talented musicians and composers, but the the audio that was coming out in games was was always you know below par and, and less than it should have been, and so I, I kind of figured out that the tools that we've got uh, you know from a, a software point of view and the, using the hardware didn't really match the tools that professional musicians were used to using and uh, that would use in in studios. So we kind of set out, we span out and uh, left the uh, the teaching. And we went to do audio tools for uh, for the games industry. We did some some really cool work for uh, PSP, PSP and the and the PS3. Um, and it was just really about can we make tools that a musician would understand and be able to get you know better results out of. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's led on to you know as we we started doing this we we found a, a cool way of controlling speakers and. Uh, you know, a few years later, here we are doing this. So that that leads very nicely into your your company now, Santia, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, which you started, I believe, in two thousand four. Is that correct? Uh, in yeah, in various guises, we we really started doing what we're doing now um, around two thousand nine. Mm. Yeah. And the technology is called Stable Phase Technology, or SPT. Mm-hmm. So how did how did you come about? Uh, developing it, and obviously most of the time we're going to spend on the show today is discussing how it works. Mm -hmm. Okay, so SPT, stable phase technology, it's kind of the the basis of of what we do, and, you know, we're doing lots of different things uh, at the moment, but the stable phase technology really, the impetus for that is as as a recording engineer and composer, you know, studio musician, I was used to spending countless hours, uh, you know, mixing and engineering uh, a track, and you would listen to it on all, you know, all sorts of different monitor speakers. And we'd, you, if you've been into any any big studios, of course, you've got the big Jennies, you know, stuff mounted in the walls or or quested monitors or or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you know, we all kind of know in the studios, certainly on the music production side that quite often they're for, for show and for, you know, for the paying clients. Uh, because if you mix stuff on, on those big monitors alone, it'll never sound anything like that on anything else. And so, you know, the, the dirty secret of a lot of the music industry at the time was whatever you had installed in the studio, you'd still mix it on, you know, NS10s, little Yamaha NS10s with uh, a piece of toilet roll folded up and stuck over the tweeter. Because yeah. uh, they were a bit bright at the time. I actually talked with that about a, a Yamaha VP who was who was on the show some time <laughs> ago, and I reme- we were remembering the NS10 and putting the toilet paper on the on yeah, the tweeter, right. just kind of dampen it down a little bit. But you're yeah. right; you have to in a in a recording studio, you often do re- mix on lesser speakers because you yep. know that's what's what it's going to get played on. Exactly, and that and that's that was a huge frustration because. Not only do you you try it on the the smaller near field monitors and and the the grot boxes as as we call them you know the the single drive unit uh, speakers, you you listen to it in your car, you listen to it on different monitors, you get used to the those speakers and and the room, and yet you'd still go and listen to the track on someone else's hi fi or you know whatever audio system they've got in a different room, and it's a different mix. It's you know it's an entirely different piece of content, and you know that's that's hugely frustrating. You can, it's very difficult to legislate for for that and, and know how people are going to use it. And so the SPT that we ha- are using right now is really it's a software solution to start with, and it's being put into uh, partner products. So the first product to hit the market with this is uh, an LG. Uh, range of soundbars, and this software solution uh, helps to control the speaker device. First of all, we characterize it, we learn a lot about that audio device, and then we can do all sorts of corrections there, which 
mean that you've got a, a calibrated system and you know it's it's back to it's a, a well-worn phrase uh, sometimes misused but it is about the artist's intention the producer's intention so mm-hmm. we're not trying to make a colorful speaker we're actually just trying to give you the detail that the guys that you know made that soundtrack um you know wanted you to hear uh, Beatmaster in the chat room is asking, don't forget the normalization effect that uh, many MP3 players add. Must drive producers crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's an understatement. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so uh, I think what I, what I understand from this, and I, and I must admit I saw a, a demonstration at CES in the right, THX right. room, and we'll, we'll talk about your relationship mm-hmm. with THX in a minute. Mm. Uh, but I also heard a demonstration in, of the LG soundbar you mentioned uh, in mm-hmm. the Santia booth there mm-hmm. on the show floor. And yep. from my understanding, from what I was talking about with, with various people there, was that, that this SPT technology must be applied individually to each speaker. And it really is meant to be applied to speakers more than anything else, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, simplistically, it's uh, you can say that it's applied to speakers. Really, it's it's anything that it makes a noise. But we look at the entire device. So yes, yes. The, the the speaker is obviously the weak point in most audio systems. The speakers are really good at making heat uh, more <laughs> than anything else. You know, the the extremely inefficient moving coil speaker designs extremely inefficient, um, and you know they, they produce a lot more heat than sound. Um, and so we that, that's often the weak point in in most audio change and so that's the thing that needs the most correction mm-hmm. but we characterize the entire device and you're right in what you say that we you know we have to look at the entire device and it has to be for that particular uh model um so it's it's kind of like the um well like Alan Kay said about uh you know, if you're if you're into software and you want to do that very well, then you've got to be into hardware too. Uh, for us to understand what the speaker is going to do, and you know, therefore to be able to correct it, we've we've got to understand the entire device. We've got to get into the hardware, and so this is not an add-on stage at the end. This is something that we we get involved with the manufacturers with as they're creating design in the products. And, you know, we do a, a very specific solution for that, all using the same uh, stable phase technology as its basis. Right. But applied individually to the measurements you get from exactly. a, a given system. So the way I was, yep. it was described to me was you, you take a given product like this LG soundbar mm-hmm. or some other mm-hmm. set of speakers or whatever, and, yep. and you do a lot of measurements on them, first of all. Mm. Uh, measuring cabinet resonances, phase and frequency response, distortions, yep. that sort of thing. A Am I correct on that? Massive amount of data. Yeah, we 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 analyze the heck out of the, the thing. It's, it's we we get an, an awful lot of data in in there. We measure it electrically. We do acoustic simulations. You know, we look at the physical properties of the box that it's in. The actual drive units are measured electrically and acoustically, um, and it's. The, the the thing is that, uh, you know, speakers and speaker systems are dynamic in nature as well. So the industry has got, you know, standard testing practices and, you know, you can stick it on a, a measurement system. We won't go and name the names, but generally these things are tested or calibrated with a, a three-second sign sweep, pass through it and, you know, deconvolve that and think that it gives you all the information about the system. And uh, it's far from it, you know. So we've we've got to analyze these speakers under different stresses, under different loads, at different temperatures, different amounts of time, different frequencies at different volumes. And we create this really dynamic characterization uh, of the whole system, uh, which allows us to do a, a very precise correction and, and give us some, you know, really quite quite uh, stunning results from from that. Now I have a we have several graphics we're gonna show. One of them is okay. called uh, um, Santia process, I believe. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to have to look look up my list of uh, of of images that I sent up to uh, okay. to John, but hopefully we will see that one, and that will show us. Um, here it is. Okay. Uh, so we can see the process by which th- that you have to go through for each product that you are going to apply this technology to. 
Mm -hmm. So this this is not so much about the actual technology, but certainly about the engagement that we take. You know, we, as I said, we get involved um, as early as, as as possible. We would like to to know about the system. We we measure the 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 audio performance on that. We go right from the input ADCs through to the amplifiers, filters, cabinet acoustics, you know, transducer, uh, the whole nine yards. And we create that customized uh, flavor of SPT correction and algorithms for that particular product. Now and those uh, those algorithms run on on the DSP that's it's in the system already, or you have to add that's, a that's separate correct, one. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. you know most most integrated systems nowadays have got microcontroller DSP. Uh, you know that we can we can run quite happily on. Mm -hmm. um, so let's take a quick look at Santia app before and Santia after these two images that I wanted to show everybody. Uh, why don't you describe a little bit about what we're going, what we're looking at here? And keep in mind that uh, many people are going to be listening to this podcast and not watching it, so <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we have to be a little careful there. I don't just wave my hands around. Yeah, exactly. So, look, looking at this, uh, we've got another slide which shows uh, the phase distortions. Um, you know, when we've got multiple drive units, these drive units can fight each other, uh, you know, acoustically in the air and create beaming effects, hot and cold spots, narrow, small listening areas. We not only correct that, but we also correct all of the response from the individual drive units themselves. So this works from a mono system right up to, uh, you know, stereo multi-way systems or even multi-way uh, surround systems. Uh, we'll treat the entire crossover as well as, you know, the drivers as well as the, the box and acoustics. And then if we take a look at the lay at the after image, we'll see uh, a representation of what the Santia system does. Yeah. So as as you've mentioned, the, the technology we refer to as stable phase technology, the output is actually a, a full linear phase system. Uh, the reason that we call it stable phase is... Uh, you know, speakers are dynamic. Uh, the reactive loads that change the response all of the time. So the, the last thing that you can do and expect a, a stable linear output is to use a static filter, which is common, at the, you know, in the industry at the moment. And mm -hmm. so we use nonlinear processing to keep that stable uh, response. But you can see from, if you're watching, you can see the, the slide there, you can see that the, the sound waves from each drive unit are in sync now, uh, not, not acting uh, destructively. And so you get a much louder, cleaner output with a wider listening spot, uh, you know, and a, a much more live and accurate sound. Mm -hmm. uh, Luis in the chat room has a very good question. Uh, can mm -hmm. the SPT process be retrofitted into an existing speaker system that you already have? That's a really good question. Um, today, no, we don't do that. Um, simply because it's, you know, it's very hard to do. As I said, we need to know a lot about the product. Uh, the, the, the depth and level of uh, analysis that, that goes into uh, creating these characterizations and optimizations um, it, you know, is, is, is really in depth. And so we need to get our hands on the actual products. We need to integrate well with the DSP. You know, there's a lot of code optimization, uh, in, in the device as well. So we like to work with, uh, with the manufacturers that, that bring these products to market and see if we can help throughout the production. Um, you know, we, we need to test to, to make sure that things are always operating in safe ranges um, and you need to have a, a good in-depth knowledge of uh, the engineering and the product. So it's, you know, maybe someday, but it's it's not a very simple uh, solution to stick a box on at the end uh, right. where we are right, right. now. You, you really need to be involved in, in, in the creation and uh, and the engineering and ma manufacture of yes. the speakers yeah. right from the yeah. beginning. Hmm. Um, I got a couple other questions. Uh, uh, Midnight Rider asks... What what? How does this work, or can it be applied to electrostatic speakers? Uh, yes, it can. Well, the honest answer is that we're just getting started 
on this, <laughs> and so we're going to we're going to find out where it works, where it works well. Um, so far, what I can say is that we've tried all different types of uh, drive units, uh, you know, from ribbon tweeters, piezos, moving coils, um, and we get great in increases in performance from all of these. Uh, the quality and the, the type of changes seems to vary uh, between different systems. Um, and as I say, we're going we're gonna to learn more about it as, as we go on. Sure. So. I, I, it, as I mentioned before, at CES, I heard two demos, one in yep. the THX room, which mm -hmm. uh, consisted of very expensive uh, mm. bookshelf speakers and very mm -hmm. high-end amplification electronics. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that the difference, and of course there was an on off and, you know, here, here it is with the SPT on, here it is with the SPT sure. off. Sure. Um, and I must admit the difference was relatively small. There wasn't a huge difference between applying this technology or not. But hmm. then when I went to the Santia booth and heard the LG sound bar, I heard a much greater delta, if you will, it's, between it's big, on and off. Yeah. 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 Um, that's, that's quite a nice statement um, because, of course, the, the LG soundbar on the, the demo booth there is a real product. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not tech demo. Um, right. but, but actually, uh, we may have been a, a victim of our own success on the, uh, on the THX demo there because, you know, if it sounds anything like, and, and most people would say that there's, there's definitely um, a, a marked improvement. You can hear the, uh, a, an improvement, not just a difference on the on-off uh, with, with the Sontia system. Uh, but that was running on, uh, I think, $14,000 uh, speakers, really yeah. high-end, yeah. very good performance. You know, if you, you measure those in the lab, very flat frequency response, very accurate. It was running on a, a THX Ultra 2 Aragon amplifier, you know, really high-end performance, great damping factor for those control those big speakers. But the... The difference in, in that demo is that when we switched to the Sontia solution with the uh, SPT optimization, that was actually running then on, uh, on small 25 watt per channel class D uh, amplifiers really designed for TVs running off a, a PC laptop power supply, um, much, much lower end uh, components. So we're showing the difference that we can actually do with software engineering, uh, not to say that the hardware engine, engineering's a, a bad thing. We'd always like people to design better quality equipment and better quality speakers, but just to show, you know, the, the difference in, in cost and, in, and size and heat and, and everything else that you get with, you know, big amplifiers and big speakers, what you can actually do with software. Um, well, that's a, that's very interesting. I had forgotten, in fact, that that when you switched on the Santia uh, algorithm, that you switched from that big giant Aragon amp to mm -hmm. little twenty-five watt Class D <laughs> amplifiers, yeah. Yeah. Um, and and you know the the sound did not degrade significantly no. at all. So no. that really no. says something. I agree. Yeah, uh, got a couple. And, a and couple that's more. not saying that the the Aragon's bad. So you know, it was a, a great amplifier. Oh, it's a great um, amp, sure. You know, but uh, we like to see what we can do with with great hardware and great software. Yeah. Um, somebody here in the chat room, I'm trying to find it. Oh, Beatmaster, of course, is asking, um, how does this compare with Odyssey? So, um, well, I'm I'm not going to go specific into. You know, there are various people doing. They're sort of different things. They're doing. They're, 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 they're different things. Um, I, I should talk a bit more about how the the technology works and and how we're doing things different. I, you yep. know, fundamentally, I applaud anybody that's you know trying to inject better quality audio uh, into into consumer experience. It's a very very worthy cause. Um, you know, we've got our own take on it and. Or oh, you've heard the demos. Uh, one of the other the other demos that you heard on on the booth has got uh, other industry standard speaker correction, shall we say, versus <laughs> the Sontia um, uh, speaker correction. Um, and well, you, you heard that difference, and uh, it's you know most yeah, people. Yeah, it's true. Hear pretty much. The main difference I think we want to point out here is that that Odyssey uh, is applied after the fact. 
uh, and it does some measurements and so on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to whatever speakers are in are in the room, and it sort of takes the room into account. Yep. Um, whereas Santia SPT uh, analyzes an individual speaker product and applies yep. itself to that sort of ahead of time. In fact, a Mooncat in the chat room was asking how how does SPT deal with room acoustics or 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 does it remove them or obviously you can't know what the room acoustics are going to be when when a speaker that you've done your thing to it where it's where it goes so it's that's the room's exactly. going to have some some effect on the sound yeah well our our take and ethos on on that is you know looking at the odyssey and, and other systems fundamentally we do an awful lot more uh analysis of of the actual products because we're able to you know, as I just described, getting into the product early on, being uh, involved in the actual makeup of the product and, and the engineering, or at least seeing what's there, we can accommodate much better with that when we're involved. And so we're, we're more deeply involved on that side. But then also, as you point out, uh, you know, the, the Odyssey have got their room correction system. What we try and do is actually get back to the speaker and make sure that the output of the speaker is as perfect as possible. You know, as human beings, we're actually really very good at reverse ray tracing acoustics, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever, you know, for, for example, one of the first sort of recording modules that we would always do in, when I was lecturing would be, you know, to, to record some uh, drum overhead mics. Um, and everybody would come out of the room. You, you'd set the mics up, uh, you know, using monitor earphones, and you set the mics up in the room. You'd listen to it, sound great. You'd go and listen to the recording in a different room, and everybody's always surprised when they first start recording how much more room you seem to capture on the recording than when you actually stood there in the room. Mm. And, of course, microphones hear the world differently to our ears uh, because when we're in a room, we can deduct it very easily. Um, we can correct for those systems. Uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, rooms aren't bad and, and that we shouldn't pay uh, attention to, to the acoustic designing rooms or, or treatment, be it DSP or, or otherwise. But the, the fundamental problem that I've got with other room correction systems is if you don't know what the speaker's producing to start with, how on earth can you try and fix that when it's a black box uh, problem? You know, just taking a measurement from the room and trying to work backwards and fix the room and the speaker together, um, you really got, you know, mission impossible there. So what we have done is we've tried other room correction systems on top of a Santia corrected system. And without fail so far, we've seen that the room correction systems work an awful lot better when the speaker is corrected to start with. So essentially, we allow the room correction system to do its job properly. Because we've we've sorted the uh, the output, we know that the output is calibrated from from the speaker to start with. Well, I want to get more deeply into how it works. Uh, another couple of quick questions, though, from the mm -hmm. uh, from the chat room. First, Lawn Dog is asking. Uh, so, will this system only work on stereos that are or sound systems that are a complete uh, set, meaning the the uh, amplifier and the speaker, uh, or? Can you just apply it simply to the speaker, not knowing what amp might be applied to it? No, we do. Uh, you, you may get some success with correcting just the speaker, but uh, you know our ethos is to do the entire system. Uh, a speaker will react very differently paired to a different amplifier, and so we can't just make libraries of of amps and speakers. If you like, we're going to treat the entire system as a whole. And mm -hmm. that goes back to you know the previous question, another really good question on can this be an add-on box uh, later on. That's one of the things that makes it not so simple uh, for where it is today. Right. Luis asks, what about headphones? Probably the same same issue applies there. You don't know what's driving them. Um, in in many headphones, you don't know what's driving them. In uh, in some headphones, you do know what's driving them. Um, because, of course, we can get wireless headphones are very popular uh, nowadays. And, you know, you, you've got the, the, the line driver built into uh, a DSP and Bluetooth module more often than not. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the really exciting uh, um, pieces of news that we've got at the moment is 
that we have moved into uh, CSR and the Bluetooth solutions that, that they do, and that's the vast majority of the, uh, the audio music market for, for Bluetooth. So we've gone and actually ported all of the, the Sontia algorithms from uh, DSPs, you know, separate DSPs that you get in AVR systems, soundbar TV systems. We've actually moved that and got a very tightly optimized uh, set of, of Sontia algorithms running on the, uh, the Bluetooth module in the tiny built-in DSP that exists within there. And so we're actually going to be able to start offering the Sontia solution for a whole range of convenience audio products, um, you know, such as headphones and the small, you know, jam box type speaker systems. And we're really excited about that. Because they all use basically the same Bluetooth module. More often than not, yeah. More often than not, yeah. Well, Londog has a great question here that's going to lead us into uh, a more detailed look at exactly what SPT is doing. But mm -hmm. before, we do, before we do that, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, which is Netflix. Now, of course, most of you already know that Netflix offers thousands of TV episodes and movies that can be streamed directly to just about any consumer electronics product you might have, be it a TV, a Blu-ray player, gaming console, dedicated box... Uh, your computer, of course, your smartphone, tablets, just about everything these days has a uh, Netflix app built in and uh, which lets you go and get as much of that content, that streaming content from Netflix uh, as you want, all for one low monthly fee. You can even start on one device and finish on another. So if you're in your theater and you're getting a little sleepy, uh, but you don't really want to not finish the show, you can, uh, you know, transfer over into your bedroom and fall asleep to uh, your favorite show. Now, for those few of you who have not yet tried Netflix, uh, they are offering a free 30-day trial to all Twit listeners. All you have to do is go to netflix.com slash twit. And uh, I do recommend that you try that if you haven't yet. I find it very useful for finding content that I wouldn't otherwise have access to. That's uh, netflix.com slash twit for your 30-day free trial. And we thank Netflix very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks and the entire Twit network. So, um, Chris, Londog in the chat room is asking, what are the criteria for identifying what you're trying to achieve? Basically, what should a stereo or a, sound, a system sound like? The age-old question. Um, <laughs> so what... <laughs> What is it that, what is your goal? What is your standard that you're trying to, to meet? A standard for the output is, is really simple. Uh, so it goes back to, to my experiences as a musician and audio engineer is to be able to communicate through, you know, through the playback device what the artist originally meant for you to hear. Um, and that, you know, that's why we, we can talk a bit more about the, the THX relationship in a bit, but that's, where it ties in really well with that because, of course, that's the whole reason d'etre for, for THX2 was, you know, George Lucas was making films and then, you know, going to see them at a theatre and just being distraught that his, his artistic vision was not being communicated properly and that the, the, the details that he put in there were not seen on the screen or, or heard in the auditorium. And so... We've got very much the same ethos there of we're going to make a correct system that allows you to hear what, you know, what puts you closer to the artist. For example, we have a couple of, of uh, graphics uh, that illustrate a couple of different things. One is uh, phase distortion. And uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, we might, it might be called distortion before and distortion after. Okay, uh, so this is, this is the crux of... Uh, it's not the <laughs> slide I was expecting, but yeah. Oh, sorry. So you you can see um, a, a lot of what uh, a lot of people try to correct speaker systems based just on the frequency response. We look at frequency response and volume, and really that's looking at half the picture. Um, there are there are big problems with what we call the phase and time domain uh, performances of these systems. Now, actually. The time domain and frequency domain, you can't change one without changing the other. It's two halves of, of the same uh, jigsaw puzzle. 
Uh, but all too often, phase distortions in speakers are, are just left to one side because they're very difficult to, to characterize and, and more difficult to correct. We can change them. Um, you know, we have no problem in creating filter systems which change phase responses, but actually to correct them is a very difficult thing to do. I think actually the graphic we might want to be looking at is called phase. So uh, we, we, I might have called up the wrong one. There you go. Is that the one you were thinking That's of? That's okay, yeah. So this actually shows, um, I don't know how much, how much detail that you, you can see on, uh, on, on the labeling there, but you can see actually some other speaker correction systems um, which are trying to address the phase, and you can see these three overlaid we, lines. We can, um, we can zoom in, in fact, to the upper, upper right. As there long as go. they don't have, yeah, we've got third-party speaker <laughs> optimization, so that's safe. Um, but these, you know, the, these other systems, this is on a, a, a commercial product which has uh, three separate uh, licenses for, for speaker corrections in different listening modes. This is actually from a, a commercially available TV. And you can see that actually to, to different extents, they flatten the, the overall response, make a smoother line, but it still falls off radically and, and drops off at the end. And so it can be straighter, but not, you know, not flat in its response. Whereas if you go across to the same exact system running the Sontia calibration, uh, you'll see that there's very little deviation in that phase response. It's, you know, pretty ruler flat across the, the audio bandwidth. Which is really critical, uh, I think, to maintaining uh, a very high quality uh, and accurate portrayal of what's coming in. Absolutely. I mean, we, you know, we can deal with bandwidth limited speakers. Uh, you know, we used to putting subwoofers with smaller speakers to, to, you know, put the low frequencies back in there. But speakers all, you know, all make these, uh, these nasty phase distortions, which you're not used to hearing in real life. And it's one of the things that instantly tells you, I'm listening to a speaker. Um, and we don't like that. We want to we want to listen to to realistic sounds. And so I liken one way of, of of getting your head around this if you if you're not into you know analyzing speakers is to compare it to a lens on a camera. Oh, and we have so, some is we have some images there too. Singer one okay. through seven. Let's start so with. We, yeah, so singer you, okay, one. Yeah, that's a, a good uh, illustration. If you were to look at a bad lens on a camera. Uh, it spreads frequencies of light, and you can see this blurred image with with a, with a color fringing. All speakers, you know, actually release different frequencies at different times, and they spread the frequencies of sound in much the same way that you get this chromatic aberration in a camera lens or a projector lens. And so if you were to take that, you can see that there's a loss of definition, that the, that the color balance is all wrong. You know, face looks quite red there. It's, it's bleeding into the skin tones. And so you could use a, an equalization tool to, to try and flatten that response. There's somewhat of a losing battle, though, because if, if you move on to, uh, to the next slide, you should probably see what you can do there. If, for example, you've got a, a red face. We can turn the reds down. If we go to if we go to speak uh, singer two, you know we pull the reds down, and all of a sudden the face looks green. It it adjusts everything, not just the areas that we we want to fix. And uh, you know, if we then move on to the next one, you see that you can adjust the greens down and try and equalize that. And you can see now that we've ended up with. You know, a much more monochromatic. We're we're heading towards a, a very grayed out image, uh, more natural in the in the skin tone somewhat, um, but we've lost a lot of definition. You can Im improve that still and and try and adjust the contrast with dynamic range control, um, but it's still not a natural image. And the problem is, as I say, it's looking at just one half of the picture when we try and voice. Uh, speaker systems in the traditional sense of EQs and dynamic range control. If we go back and we fix these phase distortions, we can actually align all the frequencies together and without having to resort to equalization in the system, we can get much better, uh, more natural audio performance. Of course, just, as, just as in this, in this visual example, for those of you who are watching, 
uh, we've corrected the uh, chromatic aberration, the smearing Ooh. of red and green mm -hmm. um, by doing what in this case? So that's just aligning all of the different uh, color channels uh, is, is doing exactly as, as you've done there is the same as, as we do essentially with the speaker system, aligning all of the frequencies and balancing them out gives you that, you know, that's the same picture there and you've got a much greater uh, resolution and, uh, and detail as, as well as skin tone um, and uh, accuracy. But we can improve that further still. You know, some people like to have voiced systems uh, where, you know, some audio manufacturers have got certain characteristic uh, sonic signatures, if you like, or a user may want to add in uh, their own preference to uh, to their listening style or room that they're in, and we can do that too. Um, so the next it, picture would show us there's a little bit slightly altered image uh, yeah. with probably the the viewer, in this case, the viewer's preference for a little more saturation or whatever. Exactly. So by, by doing this and using our tools and, and altering the algorithm, we can actually do this in a way that doesn't then put that chromatic aberration and phase distortions back into the audio signal. So if you were just to try and put compressors and EQs on top of this, you can damage a lot of that, you know, a lot of the good work that we've, we've done in correcting the system. So we have a, a tool chain um, which allows uh, the, the equipment manufacturer or the voicing engineers or potentially the end user to alter the the audio uh, performance of the device while still keeping the detail and keeping it you know truer to the original without mm -hmm. creating these distortions. Uh, Doctor T in the chat room is saying he, a bit confused about a couple statements on your website, uh, which is Santia.com. Uh, mm -hmm. Santia SPT integrates seamlessly, can be ported onto most platforms, meaning no additional hardware. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that is, as, as I said before, based on we work in, in the actual products. So, you know, today's uh, consumer audio devices, be they soundbars, TVs, jam boxes, headphones, uh, most of these devices now necessarily have got the required microprocessors, uh, DSPs, which we can, you know, fit our code onto. Uh, especially in the case of Bluetooth. What it doesn't do is uh, just somehow do a magic fix on a set of passive uh, bookshelves uh, without any any other hardware. Obviously, we need something to load the, the algorithms onto. A mm -hmm, mm -hmm. couple other images I wanted to quickly show. Uh, one was the impulse response uh, graphic mm. that we have here that little I think is very interesting. An impulse is just a very short, quick uh, sound wave that lasts a very short period of time that's that's mm. fed into a speaker, and then we look at what happens to the output. And uh, I think it's called impulse response. If we can pull that mm -hmm. up, uh, we'll be able to see. Uh, there it is. It needs to be zoomed out a little bit. If we can, maybe we can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well... Um, Anyway, I'm sure what it would we're have been a good, a good graphic. But it would have been yeah, a good graphic. The, the there, impulse it is, response. there it is. Oh, there you go. There we go. Okay, so so when you look at uh, the impulse response of a speaker, essentially we say um, the quicker a speaker can start and stop, the more accurate it is. Um, and so that's kind of the the holy grail, you know, of of a perfect speaker system is that it's instantaneously able to start and stop. Um, and traditionally. Um, speakers don't do that. Um, and sure, so there's, what there's, we, a, there's what, something called inertia, right? Once yes, you get a speaker yeah. moving, yep. it, it's going to keep moving, even if you remove the impetus or the impulse in this case, uh, mm -hmm. it's going to keep moving. And we see it here. We see a, a sharp peak where the impulse came in, but then the speaker, um, you know, continues to vibrate for a while. Yeah, and what's interesting is, is, as well, when you look at impulse responses, if it's if it's not uh, an entirely accurate or, or flat response, you always get before the main spike. You'll you'll get some uh, some movement beforehand as it gears up for that, mm. if you like. Whereas once if you, again, once again, it, 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 uh, uh, um, uh, I'm, I lost the word now. Um, inertia. Uh, it takes a while for the speaker to get going, 
mm -hmm. and then it takes a while for the speaker to stop. Yeah, and 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 that is you know the 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 impulse response is then tightly linked to its its performance. T as I said, time domain and and frequency domain, it's actually the same thing. If you look at uh, a corrected response, you'll see that it's able to start and stop much much quicker. Um, so this is, these are actual recorded responses there. The other thing that you'll notice is for the same amount of energy going in, you'll see how much higher that spike is on the corrected response. Now, right. essentially, what, what we've got on the first one is we're spreading those frequencies. So it's got the same amount of energy going in, but it's dissipated and it's spread across a wider area. So you don't get that sharp focus um, it's again, you know, if you think back to those uh, those images that we had, you've lost a lot of the detail because you've smeared it. By bringing it together again, we can make that speaker, uh, you know, very dynamic, give it lots of resolution um, and uh, and detail without having to throw, uh, you know, more volts at, at the speaker. And this is really important uh, because you know we can all turn up the bass on, uh, you know, you, we're all familiar with the loudness controls things, which just essentially will turn up the, the, the bass content and the treble content. And of course, you can do that with an EQ. Um, you can lose uh, headroom in, in doing that, but also you're going to overheat the voice coils. And what we see on uh, a typical system, for example, uh, you know, the sound bars that are in, in mass production, you've got to make sure that these things don't burn up. And if we just turn the bass right up, um, you know, one, as you can testify from, uh, from, from the demos there, you listen to the bass mode with the bass turned all the way up and then move it onto the Sontia mode, which is flat, and it's got a heck of a lot more bass to it. Um, however, the, the interesting thing there is that the voice coil is actually running cooler on the Sontia mode than in the other bass mode. Uh, hmm. which so but how do you how do you as as an algorithm writer and an implementer uh how can you actually influence the inertia of the voice coil and how it moves physically well as i say we the guys will characterize this system uh to within an inch of its life really know under each uh situation what it's going to do when you give a a, a certain uh input to, to the speaker system. And by knowing exactly how the speaker will respond, the, and I say speaker meaning the entire audio system there, uh, we're able to pre-correct for that. And so it basically will, will know how the speaker is going to go wrong, and it'll know what we can do to fix that ahead of time within safe limits. And you know, so things that are just going to be impossible for the speaker to do, we don't try and do, and we don't break it. And it's a, you know, it's that a, a very fine balance. And when you get it right, and you've you've uh, done this this very detailed optimization, you can get really uh, quite astonishing results from you know from it's. To be honest, I'm I'm biased with it, um, but you have to back <laughs> me up if you if you heard it. It's you, you can have a, a hard time believing that it's the same uh, speaker system using the same amplifiers and same power supplies and. You know, same everything else. When when you switch it over, it it does. If you were listening with your eyes closed, it sounds like a a very different uh, audio system. Yeah, Doctor T asks, uh, "Are you using magnetic liquid, like for example, like shock absorbers in the car? You're not actually going in to the speaker maker and saying you need to change, uh, you know, <laughs> how you do things physically in the speaker, are you? That that's a really uh, that's a really cool idea. Um, we like that, but. Unfortunately, we don't get quite that much say in advising a speaker manufacturer what to, to do with the drivers. <laughs> um, you know, it's so so. No, we're, we're working with with the drivers that that they're already specifying, um, and we work uh, you know around those hardware designs. I mean, really, the the whole point for Sontia is that we can able enable much higher quality audio reproduction over the devices that people actually use now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if I think of just my own home, I've got, you know, I've always had big reference uh, class speaker systems, uh, which are calibrated and, you know, Sonsier optimized, and I've got a nice calibrated screen. 
and I will come in to the house and, you know, my wife and kids will be sat there watching TV off an iPad or the <laughs> MacBook or, you know, uh, another tablet, you know, <laughs> available from other manufacturers as well as Apple. Right. Um, but, you know, you're watching it on, on these systems because this is convenient. This is the way we consume audio nowadays. And and it's it's terrible that you know they they, they do a great job and and there's a, there's a, a, a good reasons for uh, for why people have moved to consume the media over these devices and they look gorgeous and they and they function beautifully um, you know very handy and easy to use and it's the best way to get your content nowadays um, but, but the audio, not with the quality that you might want. Certainly not from the audio using, you know, built-in speaker systems there. And it's not always about what they, the company have invested in the technology of the speaker. You're limited by size and, you know, design ethics, which, uh, you know, say for, for a product to be, to be cool and sexy and people want to buy and use nowadays, it's going to be thin, it's going to be light, the battery's going to last forever on it. And these are generally not things that you would do uh, when designing the products to, to make it sound good. And so essentially what we're trying to do is offer virtual acoustic uh, design into these devices too. So there's a spectrum of, uh, of products that this can go into. You've got the, the reference class uh, THX type systems that you saw there on the, you know, $14,000, $20,000 high-end hi-fi systems but you've also got making a real uh, big difference to consumer electronic stuff where, you know, it still may be a premium audio device. You know, you could imagine uh, a set of thousand pound uh, headphones, uh, but still, you know, you're limited by the design of, of headphones or jam boxes, no matter how much money you want to invest in that. There's only so much you can do with, you know, brute force uh, physical design. You cannot change the laws of physics. <laughs> as engineer scott would say i'm glad you um, attempted that uh, not me yes indeed <laughs> um so uh, when we were talking offline before the show uh mm. you had mentioned that uh, dsp is actually mm. a dirty word for many audio engineers uh, um yeah. uh, how do you how do you get around that um uh that perception um well that's a really good question um, I actually thought I was coming on the show to ask you that one. <laughs> <laughs> now, in, in all seriousness, you know, we've seen that there's been lots of other uh, audio DSP things, which, and, and digital as a whole, you know, digital got uh, a bad rep in, in audio circles because digital can be, you know, very powerful and empowering us to, to, to do great things and make great improvements but actually where it's often being commercialized is to make things cheaper, um, you know, more easily reproducible. And so that's quality was never really the driver in, in a lot of these systems. And so we're all familiar with, with DSP algorithms, you know, built into TVs or soundbars or docks or whatever, uh, you know, shipping in, in laptops, which make a difference to the sound. Mm. Uh, not necessarily an improvement. And, you know, it's great for some consumers that want to hear, you know, a change and a, and a special effect and say, wow, I've got a wow turbo button thing here. But to <laughs> us guys that, that really care about the sound, um, you know, you, you're changing it from from the original and uh, from a more accurate performance, and and that's not a good thing. So this is very much about an engineered improvement rather than just making a difference. And I guess that's one of the things where uh, THX is, is a really good, strong brand uh, to bring to this because they see, you know, they, they see all of the audio technology that's, that's out in the market and is, is coming to market. And, of course, they, they stand for, for quality. Best-in-class uh, audio systems only get uh, the THX a badge and you know so it's a it's a very good uh partnership uh, in in that sense because we we stand for the same things and you know we're we're obviously doing a good enough job 
Well, this is this, in fact, is why I, what I was hoping would lead you into THX, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because uh, I did want to make sure we we highlighted the fact that uh, Santia mm. has uh, partnered now with THX, mm -hmm. uh, and and what does that partnership mean? What uh, what will will result from that partnership? Well, this this is huge. You'll, you know, we hope it's going to be huge. What it really means is that one THX now can hit a whole range of, of product areas that it wouldn't normally have, have hit because, you know, THX has got this standard and you can make great high-end uh, audio devices like the, uh, like the demo that you saw using, you know, esoteric materials and, and uh, you know, large form factors. You, you can do that and you can make very good high-performance audio equipment but it's very good, very hard to 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 get that same guarantee of quality in smaller, thinner, aesthetically designed devices such as soundbars, docks, uh, you know, portable systems, um, which unfortunately are the things that people are using nowadays on you know on a day to day basis. And so it's really trying to put the audio quality back into those devices. That, that people are using and embracing the fact that we consume audio differently now. So it gives, it gives THX access to, uh, you know, to get into a technology play like that. I should point out what it, THX have got a certification uh, business model and you're familiar with that. You see uh, products submitted to THX and, you know, people work with THX to create THX systems that are certified. Uh, this is a THX uh, Technologies uh, product. So it's, um, so yeah, look, I've even got a, we've got a screen cloth oh, there. Oh, look, there that, it is. Okay, very good. Proves it's official. Um, so it's, <laughs> so you get the, the Sontia uh, flavor of our DSP algorithms tuned by uh, the guys at THX and integrated in systems in the same way that they do. So it doesn't have to be a certified system. Um, but it also doesn't stop it from being a certified system. So maybe we're going to see products which ordinarily on just their uh, you know, physical acu and acoustic design wouldn't have been able to attain THX spec. Maybe now we can actually improve the performance of those devices to, to bring them up to THX spec, but also to, to hit different product groups that are not in the, the certification class so that we can get a THX technologies and uh, you know these guys have uh, have set up a lab uh, to to use Sontia technology, and we're incorporating some of the uh, THX technologies, uh, like you've seen, like Loudness Plus, etc., mm -hmm. can also be brought. And we do uh, put that into the Sontia suite and algorithms, and, and integrate that into uh, into uh, our SPT solutions. And uh, finally, we're running out of time, but I would like uh, somebody in the chat room asked, and I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, uh, what products can we find the Santia SPT technology in now? And what products can you tell us about will be coming down the pipe? <laughs> um, so, so right now you can see this in uh, a couple of LG soundbars. This is a, a 2020 soundbar was the first uh, soundbar is actually the first commercially available uh, mass production linear phase speaker system anywhere that we've been able to see. And that features the Sontia technology. And so that's, uh, you know, it gives a, a really great performance from that uh, small form factor. There's going to be a couple more uh, uh, products with LG that you'll see coming out over this next year. Um, we hope to see some really great and exciting products with uh, alongside THX. Uh, released uh, later on this year. Um, um, and I obviously can't speak too much about the unreleased products, unfortunately, this time. Right, but right. I'll promise, I'll, I'll promise to let you know as soon as we can. Excellent, excellent. Well, I really do appreciate it. It sounds like a, a fabulous uh, technology, and the demo I heard was very impressive. So I Thank do look you. forward Thanks, I do look forward to uh, hearing more about it. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much for being here, uh, especially so late at night, uh, all the way from uh, London, I think. You're in London, right? I'm in Sheffield. Minute. Sheffield, okay. Still, plenty late enough for you. Uh, and thank you for uh, staying up to, uh, to talk with us today. I really appreciate it. No problem, Scott. It's a pleasure.
So that's uh, Chris Vernon. He's the CEO of Sontia and the inventor of stable phase technology. Um, and you can learn more about it, of course, at Sontia.com. That's S-O-N-T-I-A.com. You can find me online at avsforum.com as well as hometheaterhifi.com. You can also email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott. Next week, I have two guest geeks scheduled, uh, Jim Venable and Alan Ruberg, both of the WISA Association. That's the Wireless Speaker and Audio Association to talk about what else? wireless audio. There are some really exciting things happening in that field. Uh, after many years of uh, wireless audio kind of being the poor stepchild of, uh, of real audio, I think we're about to see some major improvements in that whole area. So I do hope you will join me for that. Until then, geek out. Geek out.